everyone, it's Kim and welcome back to Bookmarks and Breadsticks. Welcome back to Bookmarks and Breadsticks. I am here with the second episode of Unwrapping My TBR. If you guys haven't already checked out the video, I'll link it above. Last year, I wrapped my physical TBR, which was something close to 180 books, and I am still trying to work my way through them. So I had my husband, Dan, pick three books off of the shelf, and I'm going to unwrap one of them that I need to read by the end of February. Now, it's already February 17th, as of filming this clip. Obviously, this is going to be a reading vlog, so the day should pass. <laughs> That's how time works, I guess. Um, and I'm going to pick one of these to read. I am gonna, so this is the thing. Do I unwrap all three of them? Because then I will have to wrap the book I don't pick. So do I just wrap one of them? Unwrap one of them. I think I should just unwrap one of them. All right, um, I've got three in my hands. I'm gonna pick, you know what? I'm just, I'm gonna be totally honest with you guys. I'm gonna pick the shortest one, the thinnest one. So funny I unwrapped a book about cheese and I just did a video about five different ch books to read if you want to learn about cheese so this is cheese the making of the Wisconsin tradition by Jerry Apps so Wisconsin has not always been a dairy land but cheese is a notable part of its heritage in its updated edition of this classic history Jerry Apps explores the extraordinary diversity of the state's finest delicacy beginning with its humble or origins <laughs> in farmhouse kitchens Cheese examines tumultuous changes in the business over the past 20 years, including the impact of mega farms and the rise of artisanal producers. Vivid historical photographs and striking portraits of modern family operated factories reveal the delicate balance between art and science that goes into the process of turning ordinary milk into a variety of treats, from beloved cheddars to the more esoteric creations. Capturing the voice of farmers, milk haulers, makers, and graders, these stories call on us to appreciate the remarkable producers that shaped cheese making into the thriving industry today. So I have another book about cheese. That's awesome. It's about 230 pages as I flip through it, but you can already see there's lots of pictures in here. Oh, that didn't show you many pictures, but there are pictures in here, and I am super excited. So this should be a pretty easy one to read. I also have a cheese making kit. So maybe this will be like a dual purpose video, um, a read and discover where I try this um, cheese making kit that I also have that I can do at home. So yes, to summarize, for the month of February, I have unwrapped the book of cheese for my unwrapping the TBR video. I'll see you in the next clip after I've read a couple chapters. See you soon. So I'm back with my first check-in in my unwrapping my TBR talking about this book, Cheese, which is more about the Wisconsin making tradition. I'm only about 30 pages in, but I feel like my check-ins are going to be maybe more frequent just because um, it's only 200 pages. So I my hope is to have maybe one or two more check-ins and then I'll be done. So the first 30 pages are definitely the foreground. Let's understand the definitions of cheese, different types of cheese, cheese processing, and really where the origins of cheese making came from in the context of the United States. So in the United States, actually cheese really came from New York and the first known cheese producer or cheese manufacturing facility actually is based in Rome, New York in the 1800s. So shout out to my friends Stu and Erin who live in Rome. Uh, your town is small, but it is now known for something as one of the first places to make cheese. Awesome. Uh, the book has just moved us into Wisconsin, uh, which is going to be obviously the largest component of the book. It's all about cheese in Wisconsin. It's interesting that what I learned in these upfront chapters is that cheese making was actually considered domestic work. Uh, men actually really looked down on cheese making because it was women's work. They'd go milk the cows and then make cheese and take care of their family. So when the settlers are moving out to Wisconsin and realizing that the yields on grain, because they become wheat growers first, when the yields start to decline year over year because of the earliest signs of monoculture, everyone, uh, produces the lower yield because you are depleting the soil's nutrients, they realized they needed to do something else besides just grow wheat. And there was a lot of hesitance to move into cheese making because it was considered women's work, which is a load of bullshit. Load a load of bullshit. You can thank women that we have cheese. That's right. So what ends up happening is that they 
What ends up happening in the world of moving into cheese making in Wisconsin is that it starts more almost like a collective where there are multiple farmers each supplying at, search, at first the cheese curds. So a farmer will have his wife make the cheese curds, they bring it all together and then they like come together at a plant and try to make cheese with the cheese curds in the way and etc. But what's happening is that these Wisconsin farmers are trying to bring the cheese to sell to market and everyone wants New York cheese because it's more um, consistent, consistent's the word, consistent shape, consistent sizes. And they're like, screw you, Wisconsin, New York's got the best cheese ever. Um, so the Wisconsin farmers are really like banging their heads and not sure what to do. So then someone comes up with the idea of instead of let's move around the irregularities and inconsistencies of cheese curds and just start with milk. So then the farmers like three to five miles away because they're too embarrassed to be known to make cheese, bring all the milk together, like let's say 10 pails a day from all these different collab co-ops, different farms. And that's where they start to process all the milk together to make all the cheese. That's as far as I've gotten. It's just so ridiculous to imagine that we almost didn't have cheese because it was considered domestic work and was beneath men and farmers. Like, I'm sorry, cheese is amazing. I would love to make cheese my entire life. So y'all are, they, you know, I know it was the 1800s, whatever. Um, but that's where I'm at so far. I definitely am enjoying the book. These chapters are super small. We're talking like three to five pages at max. So I think by the time I'm done, there's like 50 chapters in here. I'm sorry, no, I'm sorry. There are 30 chapters in here, but some chapters are as short as two to three pages. So my goal tonight is to at least get to page like 75. My hope is to get halfway through, get to page 100, because I'm leaving for the UK on Saturday for work and it's already the end of February. I also forget February is really short for a month. So I want to get this done before I leave. Um, I also am still trying to read Simka's cookbook, Simka's book for the James Beard Food Writing Project, but I just don't think I'm going to get it done in February, which is fine. I'm reading a decade of books in 12 months. So if it takes a little longer, that's A-OK -okay with me. But I would like to at least start it because I don't want to bring that, I don't want to bring the Simka book with me to the UK because it is older and more fragile um, and I bought it used. So I don't want anything to happen to that book and I want to get this done before I leave. So more check-ins soon. Sorry for that ramble little exit intro clip, whatever, bye. So it's been a couple days. Um, I've been busy getting ready for my trip to the UK for work. The lighting's weird, the cropping's weird, the framing's weird on this. I hope you guys can just deal. I got about a hundred pages into cheese and the Wisconsin story, and I am just gonna DNF this and put this down. I wanna be clear, this is not a bad book, but this is definitely in the realm of textbook. This is factual. There is no narrative connective here. Um, and there's nothing wrong with this. This is a history book that'd be great if you were going into dairy studies. I did learn a lot, but it's just not what I want to read for leisure. And the whole point of unwrapping the TBR is to get rid of physical books. So if I don't like it, I just have to accept that I just didn't like this book. So I'm going to DNF this. Now, I did already try to pick up another book <laughs> that was on my shelves. Um, it was on my shelves, but I was actually listening to it as an audiobook, And that was Broke with Two Goats. And I'll put the picture right here. Broke with Two Goats is an eight hour long audiobook. I got about two hours in and we still hadn't even gotten to the goats. And I was I. DNF that book too. Um, so this, this memoir is about a woman who finds out that her husband, the accountant with the six figure salary, uh, has not been paying their taxes for the past five years. Um, so they owe over $150,000 in back taxes. They cannot pay their mortgage anymore. So they foreclose on their house and they have two kids. Um, one is left for college, one is in high school. And their solution is to take them and their six pets and live in this dilapidated house um, shack owned on some family's property. And that's where I gave up on the book. Um, that probably was where the goats were gonna come in, obviously. But if this was like part one of the book to get you to buy in and like have any emotional connection to this narrator, I honestly, I thought she was the most delusional woman I'd ever listened to. Um, there is some sad, like some warnings that she does come from like a previous abusive relationship. It's, it's pretty scary. So I don't want to like make fun of this woman, but I don't know who thought she could like, she just like had this sense of pride that she was like, I had four dot, we had $427 in our bank account. 
and we were going to be just fine. And I was like, like, I didn't see any empathy or like emotional, uh, a high level of emotional intelligence or like self-reflection in it. And I didn't, I wasn't rooting for her. I was like, you're an idiot. Your husband's an idiot. You bunch of idiots. Get a divorce. Tell that fucker to go to jail. I don't know. So I, had tr so I unwrapped one book and I DNF'd it. I tried another book off of my TBR, which is wrapped. I just couldn't find it. Again, I recognize the title. Um, so I feel like it's slightly cheating for what the vlog's supposed to be, but I tried it and I gave up. And now I'm stuck with a vlog that's probably 10, 15 minutes long of me giving up on books. So I pulled another one off my shelves. This says travel. A Brewer's Tale, A World, The World According to Beer. Fun fact, I have already read this. I read it with Dan over the summer uh, when we were driving across the country. So I got it off my shelves and it's read and it's done. That doesn't help this vlog. I swear to God, I didn't damn plan this. Um, so let me go put this on my shelves cause it's read and let me come back with another book. I'll be right back. Is fourth time the charm? I didn't even write uh, a topic on this one. It's a memoir. It's Miriam's Kitchen by Elizabeth Elric. Um, and it was a war it's an award-winning book from the National Jewish Book Awards. So let me read the back for you. Like many Jewish Americans, Elizabeth Elric was ambivalent about her background. She identified with Jewish cultural attitudes, but not with the institutions. She had fond memories of her Jewish grandmothers, but she found their religious practices irrelevant to her life. It wasn't until she entered the kitchen and world of her mother-in-law, Miriam, a Holocaust survivor, that Elric began to understand the importance of preserving the traditions of the past. As Elric looks on, Miriam methodically and lovingly prepares countless kosher meals while relating the often painful stories of her life in Poland and her immigration to America. These stories trigger a kind of religious awakening in Elric, who moves tentatively towards reclaiming the heritage she rejected as a, one, as a young woman. Heart render... Heart rend heartrending, funny, and wonderfully evocative. Miriam's Kitchen explores the mysterious connection between food and love and between family and history. Its, bless its stories of faith and fortitude will awaken in readers a hunger for the past while they savor the blessings of the present. Okay, so I know I can read this as an audiobook. I have the physical book. And the reason I keep mentioning audiobooks is I'm. it's Saturday. I'm quite literally going to leave for the airport in a couple of hours. I have a six-hour flight to London. Um, so... You know, all of those trips when you're in the cabs, getting to and from airports and all that stuff, it's a better time. I can't physically read when I'm in motion. It makes me super nauseous. So let's try fourth time's the charm. I'll be back later. Okay, this unwrap my TBR vlog has gone on long enough. It has now been another week. Um, I went to the UK. You'll have a whole video about going book shopping in London with me in that vlog. Um, but when I last spoke to you, I left with the intent of reading the memoir Miriam's Kitchen that I unwrapped from my shelves. Uh, I did not do that. Um, I found that I, um, how do I explain this? Being on set all the time, I really felt weird to have a book open even though we had tons of downtime. I think that was in my head. That was a lot of peer pressure but I did listen to a book on the plane ride back from London. And thankfully I know it's a book on my TBR and I know it's a book that's on my wrapped TBR. So I'll put the picture here. I actually read The Lentil Underground, Renegade Farmers and the Future of Food in America by Liz Carlisi. So this book came in at about eight hours in audiobook format. I do have the book wrapped on my TBR somewhere. Um, and it's about 322 pages and it was published in 2015. So this is really about, um, first off, lentils, which is not a food I know a lot about other than consuming it. Um, it is a very high yield, high nitrogen fixing crop. It actually has lots of benefits for soil regeneration. Um, a lot of farmers are starting to use it to help replenish the nutrients that we've stripped from the soils in America. This book specifically covers farmers in Montana. 
Um, so it really, I guess I shouldn't say, it is not a memoir. It is nonfiction. It's definitely a spe special topic. And it's an intersection of the role of lentils and regenerative, regenerative, excuse me, farming out in Montana. You follow a a large cast, I'd say, um, over me over two years of research from the author. And I loved learning about lentils. I loved learning about the process of bringing your farm from con uh, commercial into organic farming. And it was a really interesting experience. It definitely makes me want to eat more lentils. Um, let me just read the synopsis of the book because I found that it really encapsulates the book very well, okay? A protege of Michael Pollan shares the story of a little known group of renegade farmers who defied corporate agribusiness by launching a unique sustainable farm to table food movement. This story of the lentil undergrounds begins on a 280 acre homestead rooted in America's Great Plains, the Oyen family farm. 40 years ago, corporate agribusiness told small farmers like the, or the Oyens to get big or get out. But 27-year-old David Oyen decided to take a stand, becoming the first in his conservative Montana county to, radic to plant a radically different crop, organic lentils. Unlike the chemically dependent grains American farmers had been told to grow, lentils make their own fertilizer and tolerate variable climate conditions, so their families aren't beholden to industrial methods. Today, Oyen seeds and biologically diverse, oops, sorry. Today, Oyen leads an underground network of organic farmers who work with heirloom seeds and bio biologically diverse farm systems. Under the brand Timeless Natural Food, their unique business cum movement has grown into a million dollar enterprise that sells to Whole Foods, hundreds of independent natural food stores, and a host of renowned restaurants. It was a really interesting book. I love and I love when like one chef took a chance on these like big black beluga lentils, like a new type of lentil that they're growing and sticks with them for 10 plus years now. And it talks also about the pitfalls of having your first big break. Um, they first land a Trader Joe's contract that falls through very quickly after. And it goes into that area of the world because I think it's important to, un if you don't know about making food in America, and how quickly a retailer can drop you and what that can do to your business. Um, it's a really important part of the book that I'm glad it got covered because what happens is essentially farmers, you know, they harvest and plant a year out. They buy seeds based on projected volumes. And that can be detrimental when suddenly a retailer drops you. We do the same thing in ice cream. Um, we anticipate volumes based on other contemporaries in the market. So if I'm going to launch a new flavor of ice cream, I will look at volumes of a pre-existing Halo Top ice cream in the market. Maybe it's one that I'm going to swap or I'm going to look at a top performer and we'll project, you know, a year out. Um, so I started products that are launching right now in the market for Halo Top, I worked on a year ago and I was basing everything on projections. And obviously you refine projections as you get closer and closer to launch for commercial products um, for CPG goods. But for farmers, they don't really have that opportunity. Um, if you say 1 million in spring, they're going to go plant a million. And if suddenly the contract comes in and goes, sorry, I only need 200,000, they've sunk money in another $800,000 of crops that they have to find a new vendor for. And because margins are so bad, and because if you're not, if you're a commercial farmer, if you're using tons of pesticides and you're stuck in the Monsanto never ending cycle of GMO products, it can really be detrimental. A lot of, this is why we're having a collapse in farming in America, because it's not sustainable. You can only grow what they tell you to grow. And there's, you're using the Monsanto fertilizer, you're using the Monsanto seeds. It's all vertically integrated in a very corrupt way, in my opinion. So that's why the book calls these lentil farmers renegades, because first off, they plant something that nobody else is planting. You know, United States is known for planting corn, wheat, and soy. These guys decide that they're going to plant lentils. And on top of it, these are nitrogen fixing plants. They create their own fertilizer. And that's actually where David Oyen starts the business is by making this green fertilizer. Then he realizes that he can sell the lentils for people to eat. Then he starts looking at breeding and other varieties and getting grants from the government. It's really a fascinating book, but really quick. I really, really liked it. I also liked learning about like the weekend farmer and the people who, 
I really enjoyed the stories of other cast members, I'm gonna call them cast members, of the weekend farmer who can't get a line of credit from the bank for their small business because being a farmer is considered a liability to the bank. So this couple goes to get a line of credit for their small business because they want to also grow these lentils through David Oyen. And at first they're approved because it's on their personal credit card. They both make six figures and the bank thinks they're opening another credit card. And they go, sure, here you go. And they go, no, 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 I want this separate, separate from my personal finances. I want a business finance, business credit card. And the bank goes, no. And they reject the credit card only because it moves from personal to business. And the justification of the business is it's a farm. That is the world we live in nowadays. And this book is now seven years old. I, as a small business owner, I have a lot of empathy for this world. And like, it's why I want to work with more small businesses and small farmers, because this, the lentil underground, like freak, man, I want to buy lentil seeds. And when the winter's over and spring comes, I want to plant lentils in my backyard because I want to put nitrogen back in my soil and I want to be able to grow things. And it's a great cover crop. I'm like super, super psyched after reading this book. So I'm definitely going to see it's a really hardy climate resistant plant. So it should be able to handle buffalo. And it's a perennial, I think perennial, meaning it'll come back every year. How awesome would that be? So anyway, this was a whirlwind of an unwrap my TBR. Um, I DNF'd two books. I finished this book. I didn't finish Miriam's Kitchen, which I I swear it's an audiobook option. And I think because I've been using Scribed so much because I was traveling, it pulled the option from me. If you guys have used Scribed and you find books disappear like that, can you let me know in the comments below? Because I think like I sound insane, but I don't think I am. Anyway, thank you for watching my Unwrap the TBR for February. It's even though this is probably gonna go up mid-March. If you haven't already, please hit like and subscribe. I post new content every Tuesday and Saturday. And if you want to see what I'm reading and stay more up to date, you can follow me on my social media links down in the description box, specifically Storygraph and Instagram. And you could also learn more about all of my read it and eat food and book boxes. I hope you're well. See you in the next one. Bye.